Did you have coffee? I had three of them. Yeah, just to wake me up a little bit. All right. So, guys, I'm Dimitris from Greece, all the way from Athens. I'm so happy to be here, my first time uh, in Silicon Valley, and I'm loving it. So, I'm here to introduce you a very special speaker, Selena. Um, she's the CTO of SurveyMonkey. So, Selena um, started in uh, 2009, and before that, she was uh, the head of VP of operations and product at um, Ticketmasters, Europe's division, where she managed the 200 people team. Uh, and prior to that, she was um, also VP of um, the um, entertainment publications company, where she, they led um, the strategic uh, operations. She also in, um, she also, she's also the founder of evi.com, an online service that is um, helping their users to create an offline event online. And they're currently sending three million invites uh, every month. And this was sold to uh, Ticketmaster back in uh, 2001. So, Selena has a BS uh, from Stanford University in computer science. And I would like to uh, welcome her so, a big round of applause for Selena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, so, what I wanted to talk about today, or we're going to talk about today, is the importance of thinking about your platform international from the start. Um, as you guys will probably learn, I'm a pretty big data nerd, so I'm going to start off everything with giving context of why and a little bit of the numbers around international and why it's important. Um, so you first look at it and think, OK, 7 out of 10 of the top internet companies are US-based. There's so much innovation happening here in Silicon Valley. There's a large US population. Why do we need to think global? Well, even of those companies, 86% of their users are international. There's 2.8 billion inter internet users, and only 10% of them are based in the US. And then when you start thinking about mobile, there's 188 million US smartphone users, and that's growing at about 9% year over year. Globally, there's 2.1 billion international smartphone users, and that's growing at 23% year over year. So these numbers sound big. I think you guys get it. International is important. But at the same time, you're a startup, you're an entrepreneur, and you're strapped for resources. And so I also understand the fact that you're not necessarily going to want to think about marketing and growth um, for international at the same time as domestic. Um, so I have one of my favorite quotes here from Albert Einstein, which says, a clever person solves a problem, a wise person avoids it. So <laughs> my goal today is just to help th put some thoughts in your head about how to be wise about thinking about globalization when that time comes. So how do you think about your platform from the start um, to make sure that when the time comes that you want to go international, that you don't have to refactor your whole code base? And I've been through it twice. It's not fun, it's not pretty, and it slows you down. So let's first talk about the application. Let's first talk about one of the most important things. And that piece is the marketing content. So you'll hear the term translation, obviously, which is taking your site and translating it into another language. But what you may have not heard of is the term called transcreation. And that's actually extremely important. When you think about how you're marketing a product, you want to talk to somebody, not just in their language in terms of the terminology, but also in terms of the words that they use and the, and the designs that they expect. Here's a home page, a Japanese home page. To many Americans, this will look busy. And that's true. If you look at the data of conversion rates of, of US sites and Scandinavian sites, people prefer more white space. When you look at the data and the research from Singapore, Malaysia, J Japan, people expect more colors, a lot more text. And so you have to not only be able to translate the site, but you have to be able to customize the site. And so use a content management system right from the start for all of that logged out site content. 
The other advantage of that is performance and speed. Being able to, I saw Michelle Zaitlin spoke earlier today, being able to use somebody like Cloudflare, use somebody like Fastly to put that content global, it makes a huge difference when you start thinking about performance and start thinking about sign-up rates, conversion rates. The second is how you think about designing your product and your platform. English, here's like the same word welcome in multiple languages. On average, an international word is 1.3 times the size of a word in English. That means when you're thinking about designing your interface, your user experience design team, your website, your creative team, have them make sure they think about how do you design for longer length text right from the start. Because again, when you go back and have to retrofit that, it's a pain. Um, think about your engineering team. How are you thinking about encoding? Again, these are conversations that you have now. They'll save you lots of time later. My Favorite topic, though, about internationalization is payments and pricing. Um, when you start to think about paying, somebody handing over you money, whether that's in a subscription, whether that's for a product, having that local experience becomes vital. How people pay is fascinatingly different across the globe. Here's an image of this little calculator. And you can't imagine it, but over 60% of the population in the Netherlands play, pays with a payment method called IDL. That means they're walking around with this, this thing in their pocket. And every time they have to pay, they have a unique code to put in. Germans don't have the same credit card history after World War II. And so most people still continue to use bank transfer. That's the most popular payment method. So when you're designing checkout and you're thinking about that experience, make sure that your system from the beginning will support multiple currencies, will support multiple payment methods. And one of the most fascinating things is price. And what I always say, or what I keep telling the team, is making sure that your system supports multiple prices for the same SKU. When you think about how you price your product, it's not just about a conversion rate of your price. There's different price elasticity in different markets. If you think about us at SurveyMonkey, the price that we can charge somebody in India is different than the price in the UK, is different than, than the US. And it's not just a conversion rate. It's different willingness to pay depending upon the value that that, that, that country and those consumers place on that product. I have this example here, which is fascinating to me, from Amazon, which shows the Hunger Games priced at 16 quid in UK and $13. 16 quid is about $20. You don't, you know, it could be because the licensing is more expensive. It could be because the, the um, to produce the book was more expensive. It could just be because the market will bear a higher price. But the thing is, when you are thinking about building your own applications, building your own systems, that flexibility of being able to price the same SKU um, differently for different markets is extremely important. And you really, on the other hand, also don't want to get caught. Because the other thing about when you're thinking about if your cost base is in America, for example, and you're thinking about foreign currency rates, they fluctuate tremendously. The pound is at an all-time low. That affects the revenue that you're bringing in and therefore what costs you can afford. You need to make sure that your system gives you the ability to change price, um, both for current customers as well as new customers. And again, these are some of the tips and tricks when you start thinking about building out your payment systems that will help you if and when you decide to go global. The other big aspect to think about is data. How are you storing your data? How are you using your data? And also, very importantly, where is your data? Um, so I think most people get it today. Think about time zone. Think about UTC. Think about UTFA. Um, for anybody who has had to convert that in their data later, it stinks. Um, so just making sure you're setting that up front. But as I was saying, one of the most important topics to think about is how are you structuring your data architecture from the start? This is one of my favorite cartoons. I think everybody can see it. But it says, before I write my name on the board, I'll need to know how you're planning on using that data. And when you start thinking about how much there is, especially in Europe, about European safe harbor, about European privacy, it is a competitive advantage to be able to tell consumers in Europe that you're storing their data in Europe. 
And so you have to think about upfront, how are you sharding your database? How are you splitting those keys? How are you thinking about unique identifiers? So that when you go to go global, when you go to put your data in a different country, when you go to think about how you're going to support China, that you don't have to re-architect your entire backend system. And also importantly in that is how are you re-aggregating the data? In order to provide great data analysis and data analytics, you want to be able to obviously re-aggregate that data for business intelligence. But how do you make sure that your business intelligence systems have no personally identifiable information, that, you're, that it's all anonymized, so that when you do recollect all that data and you are providing all that business intelligence, it, you aren't sort of then breaking, breaking the rules of those markets. Um, so the more, again, you can think about this, this will be something that absolutely affects conversion rates internationally. Um, and last but not least, an important topic here is mobile. I think you probably have heard a lot about the importance of mobile. I think everybody lives it and breathes it. But just thinking about how different the markets are internationally compared to the US when you think about mobile, it's when you think about what, what apps should I start with? Obviously, in the US, Android's at 50%. And if you look at app purchases, iOS is still far the out leader. But when you start thinking globally, Android has a much larger share. Um, and also, very importantly, starts to become mobile web. I mean, and how are you making sure that your site is responsive? When you look at some of these international markets, and I have some data from SurveyMonkey, um, if you don't think about international, if you don't think about responsive from the start, you really are kind of at a loss um, internationally. Just to give you some of those numbers, for people taking surveys at SurveyMonkey in the US, about 30% of it do it on their mobile phone. When you look at a market like Japan, it's over 60%. You know, you're sort of dead in the water, dead on arrival, if you don't work in a, in a really strong way in, on mobile internationally. Um, and thinking about mobile as well, you have to also think about what do you do when there's no connection, um, which is very, a very different thought than in the US, where your sort of expectation is that you're connected. So again, you know, my focus here today was really on, on thinking about how do you think about your application? Sit with your designers. Sit with your data architects. How do you start to think about all of those different pieces up front as you're building out your architecture so that when you decide, when your business does really well in the US and you decide you want to go global, that you're not having to invest a year, two years in redeveloping that platform. So that's what I have for you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.